Hi! Welcome to a new video! For this one, I'm actually using some different uh, recording setup. I'm recording my voice separately as well as the video, and I'm also trying some new video settings for the video recording. Now, today I want to talk about registering arbitrary entities. Now, when I say that, I basically mean just keeping track of a series of objects controlling a certain value or giving data to something. As a very simple example, for example, if we have a collider and we have multiple objects inside that collider, we want to keep track of every single one of those objects and know that they're inside the collider as well as be able to fetch which objects are in the collider, which objects are closest to the center of the collider, and so on. However, for colliders, there's actually something already done, at least for users. For users specifically, we can use a collider user tracker, which is a similar idea of what I'm going to be showing you. Now keep in mind, this is going to be a little bit more of a theoretical video, since it's more about how you structure something. It, it can be used for a lot of different things, but it's, this video is going to be about structure mostly. So first in here, I'll show you the Collider User Tracker, which is in physics, I think utility, yes. So what this would do is when a user is inside a collider, it makes a bag here, which will contain users. We will then check if there's any users inside the bag, which is what the is any user inside, and we'll locally check if the user's own user is inside, which is his local user inside. Now, if we want to do something similar with arbitrary objects, such, for example, this box here, and this capsule here, we'll need a bang. However, currently we don't have access to collections, so we can't make a bag. So in the meantime, as a workaround, we can make an empty object. Call this our register. And then the way it's going to work is that both of these objects here are going to tell the register that they exist. Now, first, we'll take the box here. So here we have the registered child. Call this just box real quick. Add a attach a component. Data. Let's add a reference field of type slot. Duplicate it once. And this will be capsule. So then we assign the box into the reference field here, and the capsule we assign into the reference field on the capsule slot. Now, right now, this is going to tell us that these both here exist. If you wanted to access to the actual objects that these are registering, we would have to simply check this field here. So what we could do for that is we could actually be using a data dynamic dynamic field, uh, no, dynamic reference field, sorry. Or yeah, dynamic reference, I mean, of type slot. And then this would be object 
reference slot. And we'll need also a data dynamic dynamic variable space of type that object here. So now we could pull this slot here and return the capsule, which we would do in uh, one sec. The flux tool simply by going to slots. Then we want to get child. So we'll get the child of register. And then, for example, child number one would be the capsule. And then under variables, dynamic, we have read and we want object of type slot and now we can actually resolve which object is registered now currently we are manually registering objects which means I manually added these into the register. Now, this is fine if your register should be static. And you might think like, well, why would I want a static register? I can just add everything into the code myself. And that's true. However, when you're thinking about scalability, even when it's as simple as multiple objects controlling one Boolean, it starts to become very, very, very annoying to have to re-add every single one of those potential triggers into an AND or any other kind of system. So what can be nice and helpful if you just have an empty object, which will basically just Keep track of whether or not it should be something should be triggered. And then basically, if you press this button, it makes a new slot, parents it to is triggered. And if you press it again, it deletes that. And all that would do is just look like this. And it could be as simple as just a name a slot or a slot that says on or a slot that references what caused the change. Because then you can simply use this is triggered here, get child, and if the zeroth child is not null, which is an operators, not null, We slot again. So this here would get, tell us that currently something is registered to this to the slot. So if we, for example, had a light switch. this light here, we could then hook this up, enabled drive, and instead of having to ever consider hooking up additional things to here, 
writing any kind of fancy logic that like it tells us whether or not one of these is active and how many of them are active we just we just make every button register itself to here and then unregister itself to here now obviously this is only helpful for a boolean if you simply want to check if anything is enabling it. So all this currently does is an any check, essentially. So if there's any of them here, it'll just enable it and the light will be active. And if every slot is disabled again, like if all of these buttons were disabled, it would output false. Now, how you specifically implement this, or what you specifically do with this, does not really matter. You can do a lot of different things with this. Uh, an example, again, that I've used this for again, is to have rooms. And every time a user walks into the room, it registers the user onto a slot like this. And the reason why I did this, despite us technically having a way to keep track of users that are in a collider, is because I needed to have an object be able to tell which user is the closest one, but only within that room also. So instead of making some bigger, more complex logic system that specifically checks for all users within a room that are that amount of distance away. Instead, I just keep track of the users in the room. And then I actually offset the slots based off of how close the user is. The way I do this is that I, for example, have my user here. Then I grab the order offset and drive it. And then we go to users. Not too low cloud, but view position. Actually, no, we can't do low cloud, but because this has to be globally accessible. So we'll do use a user root. And then user root head position. A very simple example. Uh, I guess it's not local by default. I'm going to plug in a local user here just for showcasing it, but assume that this is getting the username or user ID from here. So either the user slot is named after me or the user slot here has a reference to my user it's pulling from. And then let's say we have an object over here, this cube. And let's say this is an enemy, actually. And we want this enemy to check who is the closest one to it. So our little slots here actually have a reference to our enemy. which then they check the transform, global transform. Which we have here, and then we have our head position here. And then we just get distance from operators. So now, we know how far away that specific user of this slot here is in actual float values. Problem is that if we added another user, that one would be below it. But if that user was closer, we would then have to check every single one of those slots and their distances. And we'd have to do that every single frame 
to make sure that our enemy knows who is the closest to him. Instead, what I did is I actually went and did a multiply. I guess use this as a proxy real quick. There we go. Multiplied it, I think by a thousand I did. And then simply use this to drive the order offset. Which then gets us this value here, which has this level of precision. Now, this here is a positive offset right now, which means that the farther away we are, the lower down the list we will appear. As you can see right now, user is farther away than user 2. But let's say user 2 is a lot farther away, like 5,000. Now this is going to make sure that if we check against get child zero, that alone will actually return the user who is closest and is also registered. Because any other user that is not registered will not actually show up in this triggered state. Now, what you then do with this, whether you make the, uh, the enemy go towards that user, whether you make them fire at that user, whether you check both the distance and whether they're the closest, and then decide to fire on the user, that all depends on what you want to do with it, obviously. But there's a lot you can do with this. Now, I hope that this was informative. I hope you can make use of this. If you've got any ideas for things for me to cover in the future, do leave them down below. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye.